This week at John's, Pepsi 12 packs in the 12 ounce cans are two for $11. Sweet Baby Ray's barbecue sauce in the 28 ounce bottle is two for $5. Hunt's Manwich Sloppy Joe sauce in the can is 99 cents. Sunny Delight juice drinks, 64 ounce bottle, three for $4. U.S. Russet Potatoes in the 5-pound bag, 2 for $5. Fresh, crisp, red delicious apples, $1.19 a pound. Fresh navel oranges, 4-pound bag, $4.99. Baking size sweet potatoes, a 3-pound bag, $2.49. Fresh sleeved celery, 2 for $3. Fresh green cabbage, 49 cents a pound. Always with a great selection of meats, John's is having specials on Quarter leg chicken, 69 cents a pound this week. Boneless chicken breast, $3.99. Fresh chicken drumsticks, 79 cents a pound. And bone in chicken thighs, $1.29 a pound. If you're looking for some red meat, there's bone in rib eyes, $9.99 a pound. Boneless beef steak, $5.99 a pound. Boneless beef fajita meat, $5.99 a pound. And boneless sirloin steak. $5.99 a pound. Quarter slice chops, $1.79 a pound. Bone in country style ribs, $1.99 a pound. A whole Boston butt, $1.59 a pound. Pork riblets, $1.99 a pound. And as part of the five for $19.99 specials, you've got King Cotton Sliced Bacon, Swaggerty's Hot and Mild Roll Sausage, Roger Woods Smoked Sausage, and Ballpark Hot Dogs. So come out to John's this week and stock up on all the things that your family needs. Hi, I'm Jody Johnson and I'm here with another recreation report. Uh, we have uh, ended our spring registration. There may be a few places uh, that you could register if you still haven't registered, but you'll need to call immediately to one of our uh, offices here in uh, at Felker Park. Uh, South Walton Park or Meridian Park and see if they have any spots available and uh, our numbers are very very uh, good uh, this is the largest registration we've had in the spring um, in the last 20 years so uh, our baseball numbers went from 819 to 974 so you can just see just for baseball alone uh, they're huge and, and softball they're up to uh, uh, 450 from 420 our uh, spring soccer went from 288 to 351. So overall, we have about 2,000 kids that have registered in our program just for the spring season. We have a few on waiting list here and there. Uh, we're, this week, we're trying to work it out where everyone gets to participate. Our uh, West Walton Park is uh, is busting out of the seams. The uh, we went from 12 teams that we normally have in our five and six and seven eight to we're going to try somehow to allow 16 teams to play up there on one facility. Uh, so we know that's where the growth uh, you know, has been and, and, and is. Uh, our South Walton and our Crystal Parks are also growing, just a little bit slower pace, but uh, with all these companies coming in, we know it's just a matter of time before they also uh, uh, grow to, to the level where we're, where we're gonna need to expand parks. And with that uh, being said, uh, the county commissioners uh, have really uh, planned well, and we've, uh, through, through uh, some donations as well, uh, have have got the uh, the solution in the horizon. Of course, it's gonna take a little while to uh, to make that happen and we'll certainly get some community input when we look to uh, expand on our park system. But uh, where the, um, in the past, y'all probably know where Corn Dogs was out on Highway 81. Um, Darrell McWhorters has been kind enough to donate a good portion of that land to us and we were able to buy uh, a little bit of it uh, a few years ago. Uh, we're looking at some additional acreage around it. so. We're talking somewhere around 200 acres that could be uh, turned into some type of park for uh, you know our recreational needs, which would include some type of baseball and softball fields, some type of uh, soccer and football, and then uh, looking at some type of amphitheaters. Anyway, we're, we're going to do a entire master plan of this. We're uh, in the process of doing that now, getting some RFPs so people can come in and give us uh, uh, their uh, the, a bid on constructing all of this. So uh, we're in the process of doing that and doing it as quickly as we possibly can because we know the growth is coming fast. So um, registration numbers were great and that's a good problem to have uh, until you start doing schedules and then it's not so much so much fun. But we're gonna do the best we can to make sure everybody has a great time. Uh, and we're only as good as the volunteers that we get. 
uh, and we're always looking for volunteers, especially now with our numbers increasing. We're looking for good role models, so if you'd like to volunteer to be a coach, contact our office and uh, give us a hand. If you don't want to be a head coach or a manager, you can also be an assistant uh, with someone that uh, you may have a kid, you may not, you may just want to participate and have fun, and, and there's no better reward than, uh, than, than showing up at a grocery store and a kid sees you and you'll see them light up and come and give you a big hug. Uh, I promise you'll get a big reward if you come in and volunteer for us. If that's not your thing and you uh, were a athlete in the past, maybe you played high school, college, uh, or just uh, have a knowledge of, uh, of the game, we do have jobs available which are uh, our uh, officials, umpires, and uh, we need those desperately. We had to cancel several games last year because we didn't have enough people that would do that job. And it pays pretty well. It pays somewhere around 30 to $35 an hour is what it equates to when you talk about an hour and a half game getting $40, $45 for the game. So it's a great part-time job. We play uh, mostly Monday, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. So that's something also. Uh, give us a call here at the Rec Department. We'll put you in touch with our associations who will train you, tell you what the uh, equipment you'll need and the clothing you'll need to wear and teach you all the rules and positionings on the field. Um, so we'd love to have you do that as well. Our uh, South Walton Community Center it, um, is finally taking shape. Um, you know, they've done all the outside work, so now they've got a lot of the tedious stuff, a lot of the inside uh, work's going on. It's completely dried in, the roof's going on. Uh, they're still now looking at around March. Had some supply problems like all other businesses are having now. But I think all that's been worked out and it's, it's starting to uh, take shape and you can really start to, if you drive by uh, our park at South Walton, you'll see that, that the newest community center. And it's gonna be very nice, good. We've learned from the, the, the previous two that we built and uh, we, had, we changed a few features to make some of the community rooms bigger. The gym's a little larger. Uh, so um, even though it's a single gym, it's a little larger than Felker um, Community Center. So um, I think it's gonna be a great addition. We're also putting a, about a one mile walking track around the uh, pond. It doesn't look like a pond right now. We drained the pond so we could construct the walking track around it. City of Social Circles doing a little work with their sewer uh, extension. And uh, then we'll uh, come back in and put some type of material down around that pond once the, the dam is fixed and uh, the, the water fills back up, which won't take but about, once we uh, fix it and turn the, uh, the clog up the old dam, put the new uh, siphon system in, it won't take but about two days for that lake to fill up. There's that much water that goes through there. So it's gonna be a beautiful place to, uh, to go and visit, to walk and to uh, exercise. You know, and that uh, I always say that we do have the uh, most affordable place to live a healthy li life and a lifestyle. If you want to come join our community centers, now's a great time to do it. Uh, they're not over overly crowded, so it's a very good place to come and work out in the uh, climate control area. It never rains in our community centers, uh, and uh, the temperature is usually just right. So come and uh, walk on our walking tracks, use our Nautilus equipment, uh, get in shape, and uh, we'll. Uh, we hope you'll do that at either Meridian or at uh, Felker Park and our newest one coming in March at South Walton. So a lot of things going on here at the Recreation Department. We are growing, we are expanding, and we're here to serve you. And uh, if you would like to volunteer, please come see us. So uh, our basketball season is concluding. We've got, uh, I think we start our tournament this is coming up Saturday. And so we've got about a week left in our youth basketball season. And then we'll turn our focus onto our spring sports. So we'll, uh, head outside and brave the weather, but uh, March will be here before we know it, and uh, that will bring in spring, and that's when we'll start our games for our spring season. So until next time, remember, sportsmanship starts at home. See you then. Hey, Walton County, it's Patrice Broughton, your public information officer here with your January monthly update. We will start with our Board of Commissioners meeting uh, that we held on um, July 4th, um, 2022, our first meeting of the year. Uh, it started, of course, um, with the pledge and then uh, Chairman Thompson did the roll call of the commissioners were present um, at the first meeting. Um, we had a lot of Planning Commission recommendations on this agenda, and it started with a rezone of 7.57 acres from A1 to R1 to create four buildable lots, and uh, the application was withdrawn. 
We also had a rezone of 1.175 acres from A to B1 to R1 to create a buildable lot and it was approved. We had a rezone of 12.40 acres from A1 to A to grow and sell vegetables and eggs at market and it was approved. We had an approval with conditions uh, for a rezone of five acres from A2 to B2 and 4.92 acres from A1 to B1 for retail stores and restaurants and it was approved uh, with the following conditions. Uh, no outside storage, evergreen landscape buffer, uh, budding R1 and A1. And then we had an approval of an amendment uh, for highway corridor to neighborhood residential and rezone 44.56 acres from A1 to R1 OSC for a neighbor for a residential subdivision. The applicant was Ridgecliff and it was approved. So there was a denial of a rezone of 125.51 acres from A1 to R1 OSC to create a subdivision including variances um, and they were referred back to the Planning Commission. And then we had an approval of a rezone um, from, or of 2.25 acres from A1 to R1 to create a buildable lot and it was approved per the Planning Commission recommendations. There was an amendment to the Walton County Land Development Ordinance per errata sheet uh, dated 11-1-2021 and it was approved. There was a presentation of the uh, fiscal year 2021 audit uh, from Ryan Jones uh, with Malden and Jenkins. Uh, you can find that information online under the uh, agenda meetings tab, under the government tab on the Walton County website if you'd like to see the findings for that audit. There was a resolution for a, a fiscal year 22 budget amendment to accept of acceptance of Judicial Branch American Rescue Grant. There was also a resolution setting the time, dates, and locations of the regular month or monthly meetings for the Board of Commissioners for 2022. And you can find those date and times online as well. There was a resolution that adopted and amended the uh, and restated the ACCG 401 defined contribution plan for Walton County employees, and it was adopted. The resolution for amending the Walton County service delivery strategy to Stanton Springs and Stanton Springs North to limit Monroe's sewer service area at Monroe's request and to limit Loganville's sewer service at Loganville's request was adopted. The resolution approving local redistricting maps uh, were adopted and you can find those uh, maps again online under the Board of Commissioners tab. And there was a re resolution consenting to de de annexation of a portion of the Development Authority's property on Snow Mills Road and it was adopted. Uh, we had two staffing requests come in for the month of January uh, with the magistrate judge I'm asking for an associate judge and a supplement and that was approved and we also had staffing requests from the sheriff department for two full-time deputies and two temporary deputies that were approved. Uh, the board of commissioners uh, set appointments for the for the year with county clerk being Rhonda Hawk, the assistant county clerk being Patrice Broughton, the county attorney being Atkinson Ferguson, Vice Chairman being Timmy Shellnut, and the uh, Walton County Board of Appeals appointed Billy Mitchell to replace Penny Keener and also the rest of uh, the uh, current slate of board members for the Board of Appeals and the Walton County War and Sewage Authority reappointed their current slate. We did have an executive session um, and there was a decision made in the executive decision, except executive session, excuse me, to abolish the administrative secretary position for the Georgia, Georgia Forestry Commission. 
um, that is all that happened at the January meeting. Again, you can find these meetings online on the Walton County website. Uh, we stream these meetings live on Facebook. So if you want to follow along, you can pull up the agendas as well as the agenda packets and take a look at the meetings with us on the first Tuesdays at six o'clock. As always, if you have any questions for us here at the Walton County Board of Commissioners, please feel free to give us a call at 770-267-267. 1301 and we hope everyone is having a fantastic start to their new year. Thank you. Hello, I'm Kenny Sargent with Keep Walton Beautiful in the Walton County Recycling Center. I want to thank everyone for tuning in. Uh, we're, we're just getting through the holidays here and, and starting to uh, plan some of our spring events. Uh, I did want to take the time to thank everyone that, that, that brought uh, their old Christmas trees out for bring one for the chipper. Uh, we, we are wrapping that up now. Uh, we, we collected somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 trees this year, which is down a little bit, um, but, but that is how many we collected. Uh, just for those out there, sometimes we have some coming in uh, almost on into March. Uh, just a reminder. If you still have those old Christmas trees around the house somewhere and you haven't been able to get rid of them yet, you can still bring them here. Uh, you can just come in and ask us uh, inside or you can ask the scale house attendant uh, where to put the trees and they can direct you where to drop those off. Uh, we will stake them, still take them for a little bit longer. Uh, so no need to worry about that. We will still accept those. Uh, Coming up this spring, we are starting to gear up for, for some of our Earth Day events. We're, we're definitely going to do a document destruction event. We have uh, confirmed that we're going to be able to do that, and, and I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll set the exact date uh, here in the very near future. And we're also going to try to tag on a couple more events on to that. Uh, there will be some, some uh, cleanups throughout the county as we get on into spring and, and we'll, we'll also report on all of those uh, going forward. So that is a lot of what we're working on right now uh, and we're excited about that. So uh, again, that, that's something I'll make sure to keep uh, you posted on as we move forward. Uh, here at the Recycling Center, just a few reminders. We're still getting a lot of people that, that are slipping TVs into our computer recycling boxes uh, there in the recycling drive through uh, Just a reminder, though, the, the recycling companies will not accept those TVs or like the old school uh, CRT computer monitors. Uh, they'll only take the flat screen computer monitors and no TVs of any kind. Uh, when those get slipped in, we get charged uh, a lot for those TVs that get mixed in because they're looked at as, as contamination to the recycling. Uh, so we try our best to go through the boxes and make sure that any that have slipped in gets taken out. Uh, but it's hard to get all the way through those boxes. And, and the last couple of times there's still been a few TVs mixed in and we were left with that charge. So uh, we're going to try to keep a better eye on that uh, going forward. and and. If you do have a TV, we're going to ask that you come across the scale, uh, weigh it in, and then just throw it away out back. That's all that can be done with the TVs here. Uh, also wanted to remind everyone, uh, after some of the storms, we've had a lot of people trying to, to bring their, their trees or you know limbs and, and leaves and things that have, have blown around with some of the storms. Uh, out here to the center, just a reminder that all of those, any, any yard waste at all, leaves, limbs, shrubs, uh, grass clippings, those need to go to an inert landfill. Uh, there's plenty of those around the county. We'd be happy to, to get you a number to the nearest one to you. Uh, feel free to give us a call out here anytime. Again, our number is 770-267-1421. We'll help direct you to the right place. Uh, we're also having to turn around more loads of, of just construction debris this, this coming in. Uh, again, if you've got a board or two, uh, or, or just a very small amount of, of those things, it's not gonna cause us an issue. Uh, 
uh, really, and we're not going to turn you around for that. But, but you know, we're having people that's coming out here with, with whole decks that's been taken off their house. And we just simply can't take it anymore. Uh, the, the landfill that takes our waste has started turning our trucks around for having too much of the construction debris on it. So we just can't take it. Uh, and we, I've, I've tried to stress that as much as I could because we really do hate to have people drive all the way out here and then us have to tell them that, that we can't accept uh, their load. So if you have any questions about how much that is, you know, exactly how much you have and whether that's too much or whatever, uh, you know, feel free to call us. Uh, like I said, anything over just a very small amount of it, just a few boards or, or something like that, and, and it, it's really going to be too much. Uh, so just, just want to try to help out there as much as we can because some people, you know, get a little angry with us when, when we're not able to accept those things. But uh, again, that's really not up to us. Uh, and like I always do, uh, if you've never been out to our center before, don't have a real good idea of, of what it is we do here, uh, feel free to come out. We'll walk you through, uh, show you everything we do here, show you all of our processes uh, here at the center, and we'd be happy to get you started recycling. We'd be happy to, to give you some options on how you can volunteer uh, throughout the community. Uh, we would always love to have more volunteers. Uh, our monthly meeting is the first Tuesday of, uh, the, pardon me, our first meeting is the first Wednesday of every month. Uh, at noon, we have a noon lunch meeting. Uh, a lot of times we'll have food here for the volunteers. We would love uh, for anyone that's interested in volunteering with Keep Walton Beautiful uh, to come out and, and see some of the things we're talking about, some of the things we have going on and are planning. Uh, we'd love to have you. We could always use more volunteers. Uh, again, you're welcome to call or email me to, to ask any questions about that. But uh, come on out and see us. And if there's anything we can help you with, uh, feel free to give us a call or email us anytime. Until next time, take care. Hello and welcome to Monroe Walton Center for the Arts. Um, I want to let you know about um, kind of focusing on some free things that we have going on here that you may not be aware of. We have several actually. Um, we call them kind of as an umbrella term, we call them creative gatherings. Uh, they focus on kind of some different things. Of course, through our Walton Writers, we have two different events. Um, actually three. We have um, the first Thursday meeting and then we have a second Saturday meeting that's an open mic event. Both of those are online via Zoom and uh, they're for writers and they're open to the public and they're a lot of fun because we're actually drawing people in from all over the country on these Zoom calls so it's really kind of cool. Um, they talk about different topics relating to writing and sharing their own writing and just anything having to do with uh, publishing, writing, um, you're invited to do that. They have their own meetup group where you can get updates about um, the topics that they'll be talking about and reminders of their meetings and you can join them if you look up meet up and then look up as part of that um, Walton Writers. It should pull up. You can join that group and then you'll get alerts from Barbara Barth, our um, literary arts chair, and she will let you know when events are coming up. The third Walton Writers event is on Sundays. Barbara is here. Um, she's a published author tons of experience, lots of good ideas. Uh, she has kind of an open writers group. Just come and um, some people like to just talk about what they're writing or you can bring in what you're working on and get some ideas, do a little reading. And um, so that's on Sundays, every single Sunday um, from 1 to 1.30 to 4. Is that right, Barbara? Barbara's here the Sunday, one to four. Um, so, um, 
be sure to just drop in. All, all of those are free and open if you're interested in writing, any kind of creative writing. Um, another free event we have is the Monroe Makers. They meet every Thursday from 1 to 3, and they just bring in whatever they're working on. Sometimes they share projects, so if you come, you may get a little mini lesson in uh, um, making paper beads or something of that nature. But it just varies from week to week. They bring in what they're working on, your own projects, or if you'd like to come in and paint angels for our Art MD boxes. You can do that as well, and uh, Joanne will help you with that. And then also we have a book club that meets here once a month. It's called Not Your Mama's Book Club, and um, it's mostly ladies. I think it's really targeted to ladies. So um, if you go online to our, to our website, you'll learn all about these different events. Another thing is, um, and it's new, our first one um, will be actually over by the time you see this video, but the first one is this month in January, and we're having Doug Olson and his wife, a lot of you know them, and they play old time music. And they have anywhere from 8 to 20 musicians that come, and they'll be here on the 4th Saturday of every month from 1 to 4. And you just drop in, um, you can just drop in and listen, or you can uh, bring any acoustical instrument, nothing electronic, but any acoustical instrument and play with them. So lots of fun, lots of fun things going on with that group. Um, also wanted to let you know about our um, reception for the um, member show that's coming up. That is on Friday, uh, January 28th at 6 o'clock. It's a wine and cheese reception. The awards will be presented for the winners in our show. The show has already been judged and um, I know who the winners are and we've got a really great slate of winners to present to you. So come and support your favorite artists. Um, celebrate them with a little wine and cheese party with us. And that is on Friday, January 28th. We have an updated class list with so much going on here. It's really almost hard to cover everything. So come in and pick up an updated class list. That some weeks I have to update it two or three times because we've got new teachers coming in, hope to have um, even more starting very soon. Uh, we have our new rack cards coming up. These are great to stick on your refrigerator to remind you of the shows that we have coming up for the year. It has our website on there so you always have that handy to check and see um, what events and classes are coming up because we do. We've got we got a lot going on, and it's hard sometimes to keep up with everything. I think most months we have around 60 different events and classes going on. So I get it. It's hard to keep up. And I also want to just mention real quick the Tai Chi class, which is kind of a different thing for an art center to offer. But Tracy, um, aside from being one of our artists, here um, and she's in our shop. She makes jewelry, um, and she's actually taught a couple of classes here as well. She is a certified Tai Chi instructor, and our original thought was to have use our beautiful sculpture garden for Tai Chi classes, which is just a wonderful space. But now with the winter, it's just gotten too cold, so we have partnered with the Bridge of Georgia which is a private school here in Monroe. It's just four minutes away from us. So we have an indoor space now to have our Tai Chi classes taught by a certified instructor. Um, she's an instructor of instructors, so she's really experienced, just a fabulous class. And a lot of the things that we talk about here is that art is good for you, um, it's good for your health, it's good for your immune system, it's good for your mood and mind and body 
Um, and so this is kind of an extension of um, the things that we can do um, to keep ourselves healthy, especially uh, in, this, in this time that we're in. So Tai Chi is offered every Friday morning. It's just a one hour class from 10 to 11. And it's, it's wonderful, you'll love it. Um, so again, you can find out about that online at MonroeWaltonArts.org. Come in and pick up a class list um, and stay up to date on what we have going on. And come see the show, it is just wonderful. We've got 50 artists in the show and 100 and, I forget, I think 133 or so pieces of art in the show. Uh, we have a youth category, which is a lot of fun. So come and see the show. It's here through February 24th. Come to the reception on the 28th of January, and we hope to see you soon. Y'all take care. Hi, I'm John Raines, and I am opened up a store here in Monroe, Monroe Ace Hardware. We're at 703 West Spring Street. We'd love to have you come by and visit us. We're open Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., Saturday, 8 to 7 p.m., closed on Sundays. And uh, we'd love for you to come by and visit. We have a uh, paint department that we carry a full line of Benjamin Moore paint as well as Clark and Kensington paints. Uh, we carry a uh, full line of, of course, plumbing, hardware, uh, lawn and garden needs, and we've got uh, a, uh, some of the tools that we carry. Uh, which are some of the best brands are uh, the uh, Craftsman Tools and the uh, Milwaukee. We also have a full line of grills. Uh, we have the Weber, the Traeger, and the Big Green Egg smokers. And uh, we have coming soon, it's not in the store yet, but we will have steel two cycle equipment which we will offer uh, as well as um, repair on those items. So uh, we'd love to have you come by and visit us. We're happy and glad to be here in Monroe and uh, look forward to seeing you here at the store. If you want to call us, we can be reached at 470-970-4223. If it's easier to remember, it's 470-970-4ACE. And again, my name is John Raines. When you come in, please just ask to see me. My name is Courtney Wright. Um, I'm the executive director of Walton Powers, which is a recovery community organization here in Walton, Walton County. Um, I'm the founder, along with Kathy Beddoes, the co-founder. So an RCO is a recovery community organization. It's an independent, non-profit organization led and governed by representatives of local communities of recovery. These organizations organize recovery-focused policy advocacy activities, carry out recovery-focused community education and outreach programs for provide peer-based recovery support services to individuals. So our um, recovery community organization's core purposes are public education, putting a face and a voice on recovery, advocacy and the discrimination against people and are seeking recovery, services, peer-based and other supports for recovery and inclusion, embracing all people and all pathways to recovery. So um, our mission is to provide recovery support services to individuals and families within the community um, through advocacy, training, and peer support services. This is our wonderful team. That's me along with Kathy and Angie and our other peer outreach coordinator, so there. So um, what we are, Walton and Powers is a safe place, free of drugs and alcohol, where people can meet, gather, and recover. We're welcoming of all people and their families to get help and learn to be healthier together. It's a place where you never have to feel alone, a place to access free resources and support to all, and support to meet people like you who are doing well, and it's led by people in recovery who advocate for people in recovery. So our services um, that we offer are always free. We um, offer our services based off um, grants that we receive. Right now we have two grants from the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities. Um, one is specifically to work with individuals who have opioid and a stimulant misuse um, disorder. So it could be um, opioid, so any type of pain medication, um, heroin, cocaine, methamphetamine, I think maybe crack. Um, 
So if they have a challenge with that, then they can come to us and maybe get help. We're also working on a defects contract where we're helping um, the defects workers and the mothers who have open defects cases um, just kind of meet their goals faster and hopefully reunite the families um, faster. Um, so we offer peer-to-peer high -peer clinical recovery support services. Um, there's multiple pathways to recovery. Um, we offer sober social events, um, recreational activities, public education and advocacy. We're a resource hub, um, so we offer a lot of, this, of additional resources. If we don't offer it, then we are linked to other organizations that do offer it. Um, and we offer life skills training. This is our schedule, which has changed a lot. I need to update the slide, but we offer um, support groups. We offer all recovery meeting on Saturday. Um, we offer yoga. It's going to be on Mondays. I think it changed six Mondays at 6 o'clock. Um, and it, all of these are offered in person and virtual because of COVID. Um, we are not doing the opioid support group, we're doing a DTR meeting, which is Double Trouble and Recovery. It's for people who um, live with a substance misuse and mental health challenge. Um, it's a support group where they can go and talk about both of those. We offer a grief and loss support group for individuals who've lost someone due to a drug overdose. Um, and we offer a lot of other stuff that needs to be updated. Um, next slide. So we're currently serving about 200 peers a month. Um, 20 to 25 of those are new peers. Um, our outreach efforts at local inpatient treatment facilities, um, we're working with, we're doing, we're going into <coughs> twice a week and doing support groups and life skill classes with their um, inpatient outpatient program. We go to, I think that's on another slide, but we go to Twin Lakes and offer a support group to them. Um, some other community partners. But we assist about 35 individuals um, in seeking treatment um, and we're able to meet their needs of either getting into treatment or housing. We're providing transportation services um, to peers right now in a resource court uh, that are having, we go and support the peers in resource court and some of them are having difficulty getting back and forth. Um, so we're providing transportation for them. Um, and we provide aftercare to encourage long-term recovery and to make sure the goals are sustained. Um, our partners are Ridgeview, um, our, the Accountability Courts, Twin Lakes, we probably have a lot more. Um, and that's it, that's my contact information. Um, yeah, so I guess a little bit about me. I'm a person in long-term recovery. Um, January 5th made 12 years that I haven't used any drugs or alcohol. Because of that, um, I'm able to be a mother. Um, I'm able to be, I'm a business owner. I've started uh, two businesses and a nonprofit. Um, I'm a homeowner. I pay taxes. I vote. Um, and my life has changed because, you know, people, because of the opportunities that I was afforded when I went through treatment. Um, and so I grew up here in Monroe. Um, when I got clean, I always, you know, there was really, we didn't have anything here. Like, I thought about, like, when I was a teenager struggling with drugs and alcohol, what would have helped me? And we didn't have anything. So I'm hoping that we can create a safe place where people can come that are struggling and just be able to meet with someone that's went through a similar shared life experience, sit down, have a conversation, and just see, like, what help they want, how we can help them, and then we offer all the supports we can. We've helped, you know, tons of individuals get into housing, um, treatment, uh, the list goes on and on and on, and we just started. Like, a lot of people don't even really know that we're here yet, so I imagine I would say that um, some of the things our grants don't pay for, like if someone were to come in and have like a, just the alcohol, just challenges with alcohol and they needed help. Based off that, I'm supposed to turn them away because the grant is specific to opioids and stimulants. Um, of course, we're not gonna turn anybody away, so we'll figure out a way, but that's where different community supports and grants and stuff comes in to where the grants that we have, if these people don't fall under, that criteria, we have a different source of revenue to help. Um, one of the biggest things I would think that we've seen that we need support in is um, 
when individuals come to us, reach out and say they, they're ready to go to treatment. Um, we'll call the treatment center, we'll get, you know, see if they meet the criteria, but it may be they come in on Monday looking for help, but the treatment center can't get them in until Thursday. Well, we don't want to send them back home where people may be using, where it may not be safe. So we put them in a hotel for those two or three days, and then we transport them directly to the treatment center. Um, and so our funding doesn't cover that um, and a few other things, but yeah, that's about the basic overall just of our program. But if you guys know anybody that's struggling with substance misuse or mental health challenges and just want a safe place to go, fun activities to be involved with, people you know in recovery that they can talk to that understands what they've been through, please send them. Right now it's 18 and up. Um, my passion is like with uh, youth. So eventually my vision is to have like a, um, I don't know if it would be like a youth clubhouse or kind of like a after school program where the kids could come after school, maybe we could transport them there, have like a computer lab in one room where they can get somebody to help with their homework and then have like a game room on the other side and just provide that safe place in the afternoon, you know, maybe like 3.30 to 7 or 7.30. Um, Cause I know like for me growing up, when I got off of school, I went home to my, both of my parents being passed out on drugs. So, you know, had I had a safe place to go, that may have changed, you know, the trajectory of my life. So, um, so yeah, just, I guess, being that safe place, being that mentor, being that positive person in a young person's life. So eventually, my plan is to have a big center, but right now it's just 18 and older. And we'll be doing more events in the community. Um, we are distributed, distributors for Narcan, if you're not familiar with that, um, but with me, I'll tell you what that looks like. Um, we also are connected with our, some more of our community partners are um, Advantage Behavioral Health and um, Viewpoint. You might be familiar with those community service boards. We're, both, we're connected with both of them. Uh, we are a nonprofit, so we do get a lot of people in that don't have insurance. And so these, these places are specifically set up for, for those who don't. But we have a lot of people that come in that are, um, you know, they're, they're, well, they've gotten, kind of found themselves trapped into um, the substance use. And then, of course, it falls over into the destruction of marriage and relationships with children. And so that's where our. She's trying to say is we have some really successful people. We do. That, you know, they're just, you know, struggling with, yeah. with substance issues and maybe, yeah. And so they're able to come in and do some individuals with us or a group. They also do that. Um, it's been, that's been really successful for us. Um, and, and another thing that's been a blessing for us and the community is we've, we've been able to um, support these people in moving forward in their recovery. So that, that looks like, um, like Courtney was talking about, getting them into residential treatment or getting them into even a 45-day treatment program so that they can go back into the community and start giving back. Because that's really bottom. At the end of the day, it's about giving back for us. And because you guys do what you do when you're in this club, you know all about giving back. And so just, I just wanted to say that. And I would say, I guess, you know, um, we help a lot of people get into treatment and, and different programs. But recovery is really sustained in the community that you live in. A lot of times recovery may be initiated in jail or in treatment or somewhere like that, but recovery is really sustained in the community that you live in. So it's good to have a community that supports recovery, <coughs> that offers, you know, supports, and it just shows, it, it get, I guess it allows people to be a little bit more open and even come in and get these supports um, because of the stigma that's attached to it. Um, so, yeah. It is. I think the most important, like, I think the first year, and there's like evidence that shows like the first year is when you really need to like provide the most resources, you know, provide the most supports because, you know, your brain, and we do a training called the Science of Addiction Recovery. It's a really good training and it shows how drugs impact the brain, um, but it also shows how, it shows pictures of the brain like 
one month after someone's detox off meth, and then like six months, and then like 12 months, and it shows that 12 months, their brain almost looks back like a normal brain. But like, you know, at one month, or 30 days, or six months, there's, you can, there's like barely any activity, there's barely any, so it shows that it takes time for someone's brain to heal. So at 30 days, you may not want to take someone that's just 30 days off drugs and put them in front of a judge and ask them, you know, do you think you can take care of your kids? You know, right now they're still trying to, their brain is still craving drugs. They're still trying to figure out, can I make it another day clean? How am I, I know for me, you know, um, what led me into my recovery was I woke up one morning and my husband was dead in the bed beside me from a drug overdose at 19 years old. And I had a two-year-old son, and he was with his uh, great-grandmother that night. And it was here in town. Um, and so, you know, police come, you know, take me to the police station, of course. You know, they have to go through all that. But um, DFACS got involved, um, had a case plan. I had to go to Advantage and, and, and do classes. But, like, my whole life was flipped upside down. And... At the time, I lived in my husband's family's house, and so before I could get out of the, the jail from being interviewed, they had changed the locks. I couldn't get in to get my stuff, and so, like, you know, because he was dead and I guess I was alive, you know, they were blaming me. So it was just really a uh, uh, really scary, hopeless place to be. I really felt alone. Like, again, everybody, my mom, my dad, my brother, my sister, my grandfather, everybody used in my family, um, and then... So I woke up, my husband was dead, pretty much whole life was flipped upside down. I had to go and live with my grandmother. My son was taken away um, and I had a defects case. And of course, you know, part of the case plan is you get a job and, you, you know, you have to provide housing and, you know, be able to show that you can care for the child. Well, at the time, I was 19. I never really had a job. I dropped out of high school. I've been using drugs since I was 12. Um, the first person I smoked marijuana with was my mother. Um, at 12 years old, when I broke up with my boyfriend, she handed me um, marijuana and said, here. And it wasn't necessarily the drug that got me. I think it was the perception that her handed me something when I wasn't feeling well. And it, I guess it, it told me that if you don't like the way you feel, you can change it. You know, you can take something and change it. And so, anyways, my life was flipped upside down. I had an open defects case, and I had all these requirements. And thankfully, I was connected with a program in Athens called Peer Recovery. And there were people that, you know, went through the same training that I went through and, and provided support. And, and I made it through it, thankfully. And um, I don't know where I was going with that, but... Yeah. Well, I think the point is your environment had to change because normal in your family was drugs. Yes. So that environment has to change yeah. somehow. Yeah. And you know, these It's kind of abrupt how that happened, of course, but yeah. you had to get out of that environment. And it was a really like physically abusive relationship and, you know, it was rough. Um, and I think back at different times because I, you know, I wasn't like a bad child or anything. I just kind of, you know, parents were using my whole life. I pretty much was raised by my grandparents and just didn't really have any, like, positive role models to follow. So I think back at different times, had somebody intervened, you know, but I went through I went, what I went through and I'm here, hopefully so I can help other people. Um, you know. Thank you for doing Thank you. Doing. Yeah, she's, been a, she's sure. amazing, really amazing in this, this organization as well. Um, I don't like public speaking. He's doing really well. Yeah, you're doing fine. He doesn't show. Who does? You're doing just fine. <laughs> don't think of it as public speaking. You're just talking to us. Yeah. So, so on on a, a sort of a flip note, um, and I'm a person in long term recovery, and um, so what that means for me is I have not used any mind altering substances for a little over 11 years, and so you know. I'd like to say I came from a, really wouldn't like to say it, but I get what she's saying, which that's where she came from. That is not where I came from. My parents were not alcoholics or addicts. We were middle class um, America. Um, and I started using it at a very young age. Um, and now my sisters, I'm the youngest of four. My sisters and my brother, they all were in that lifestyle. Um, you can kind of tell I'm not young, so I was sort of brought up in the 60s and the 70s. And so that was a kind of a era where all of that was supposed to be cool, right? And so what happened with me is I sort of fell in that category and I quit college and I started doing other things. And, um, and I got married and I had three wonderful children. 
now have six wonderful grandchildren. Um, the lifestyle for my children were not, were, um, you know, I was the mother that she's talking about she had, not that I, I gave uh, drugs to my children, don't get me wrong, but they lived in that environment. You know, so, um, and, you know, I have, a, I know you won't mind me saying, I have a son who's in recovery, and I have two daughters who are not. Um, friends to Courtney when she was a teenager. Um, so, I say that to say this, it doesn't matter if, if um, what age you are, or what your background is, uh, addiction affects us all in one way or another. If it's not you, you got somebody. You know, and, and if you got somebody, that's okay. Because I have, I have grandchildren now that I'm very much like, what are you doing? Can I, use your, can I see your phone? You know, and they're like, you're kidding me, you know. But, but those kinds of things were important. Because I didn't check those things with my children. I didn't, I didn't think there was a need for that stuff. So, um, you know, difference in, in parenting skills that my children used and I did. And, um, and they're not, and, and by the way, my son is in recovery. And he was, um, you know, he went through some of the same things that Courtney. For me, I went, I, I had a, I had gotten a criminal background, so I used the accountability court system to, to allow me treatment. So it was an outpatient treatment. I got to learn how to live again. I got to learn how to be a mother again. My grandchildren have never seen me high. Um, I, I, have, I, have, I pay my own bills, I, I'm still single, <laughs> but, but I enjoy my life and I live my life on a daily basis today. I don't live for what happened in the past, I don't have to live for what I'm going to do in the future, but I can live in it today and do all I can to support this community. And, at the, and that's really what we want to do. Same as you guys, you want to support this community, that's why you do this, what you do. I'm coming to find out today. And so, um, you know, what? just a blessing to get to work. Courtney and I, when, when we had this idea, we had it for some years before we actually did it. And so we both had a lot of um, opportunity to, to grow and um, live in the community of recovery and get educated with the disease of, it, of recovery, I mean, I mean addiction, so that we can apply our recovery to that and support other people in that. And that's why we're here. So. And we've had, I think, just to highlight some of the, I'll have some pure testimonials, but I started working with, with an individual when we first opened, and, um, you know, our hope is to work with them and, and help them on their journey to recovery and get them in a place where they can manage their own lives, and they don't, you know, obviously, they, we don't want them dependent upon us. Um, and now this individual is, you know, she's applied for the state training that, that we went through and she's about to be certified and you know possibly you know hopefully we're able to provide an opportunity for her to maybe work at the center and just you know develop leaders and right. just help people so yeah. build the workforce because when we when, what I've found and what I've, I've seen is this, this workforce has really grown in the state of Georgia I don't know if you've ever heard of the peer workforce but um but these are these are individuals like us that, um, you know, I was a marketing manager before I got here, you know, and retail. So this is a total different <laughs> flip, you know. And I knew a couple of years in that this was my passion. And so we've been just kind of going through and getting educated. Um, Courtney was certified before I was. She was like, hey, Kathy, you got to do this, you know. So, and... <coughs> Obviously, Courtney's 30 years younger than I am, <laughs> or more. <laughs> Just gonna say, maybe not too much. Just the whole part, you know. something like that. <laughs> but but I've learned so much from the youth, the younger people that are in our community, and they come in, they talk to us, don't they, Courtney? And they share their experience, and they talk about what they'd like to do with their lives, and they and they they're working toward getting there. And so I just wanted to share that. But it is such an amazing thing to see these people change their lives. And it doesn't matter how old you are. You know, it doesn't matter. I was, in, I was, in, I was not in the youth when I got there. But I'm here now and I'm staying. Well, as a dad of teenagers, the issue, we're normalizing marijuana. What are your thoughts on that? Because marijuana's not bad anymore, right? Because it's fine, it doesn't hurt. That's what our teenagers are being told. 
we're wanting to legalize that. Just saw yesterday, Cobb County wants to not require their employees to take drug testing for marijuana to work on the job. That's got to be a challenge in your work because it's not. We are abstinent based. Yeah, we're completely abstinent. Per on a personal level. Yeah, on a personal level. Yeah. We don't, you know, everybody. It's a mixed story there. that we're sending people. I know that's got to be a challenge for you guys. It, it is. Um, I was contacted, uh, I forget, I think the National Association on something, and they're doing this, this big project. They actually reached out to me and asked me that I want to be the director over this new program that they started. Um, and it's a campaign about for young people about marijuana and just, you know, about, because they're pushing to legalize it. So this organization is against the legalization. So um, I know that there's a lot of stuff going on. I personally, you know, from my personal experience, it was a gateway drug for me. Exactly. You know, I think when you smoke marijuana, what it does, if, you know, personally, I don't, my mother smokes marijuana every day, but she's had cancer and, you know, and I know other people that, that do smoke it and they still go to work and they live their lives and they take care of their families and it doesn't create a problem. Um, but I think in, in, in other situations, it's just not the case. And for me, you know, when I, especially at a young age, when, I, when you smoke weed, it puts you around that lifestyle, those people that are doing it, and somebody's going to have something else in their pocket. Somebody's gonna pull something else. Oh, hey, you're, you know, and, and your it's ambitions just, are lower. My, I have a, I probably you would imagine this, but I have a 15 year old son, um, and so my biggest fear is that he was gonna grow up and, and use. And he, I found out he started smoking marijuana, and it has been a challenge. You know, the vaping and the, you know, all these new gadgets. I went to Chicago to visit a recovery community organization up there a few months ago, and they had this. I would love to do it here. Um, they had this truck outside, and it had kids couldn't go in it because you know we could take pictures because kids have good ideas. But if you would be blown away by the things that they can buy on like Amazon and hide stuff in. I mean, Coke cans that if you picked up, it looks like a Coke can. It has a lid. It looks unopened. It's full. All you do is pop the top off, and it's got a place you can hide stuff. Water bottles. I mean. I did take pictures. She asked me not to share them, but it 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 was. I mean, they had like a, a glass case with different drugs, just to educate the parents on different drugs because they're changing, you know. And then the ways that kids are hiding them and stuff that school, like stuff that you take to school, canisters and stuff to have. I mean, you would never think to check these. Or if you picked it up, I'd probably put the coke in the refrigerator. You know, like it's serious. And it's, it was, it. I was like, wow. You know, like, you know, people need to be educated. But yes, that is a, a big issue. And vaping is a big issue. You yeah. know, a big issue. I know when I went um, out of state, most states you can't buy anything flavored. Nothing. No vapes. No, not you know, barely cigarettes. Barely. Uh, menthol cigarettes, but in Georgia, they you know they don't have any restrictions on it. So in other states, that's not oh. as common as it is here. Oh no! That's when I went to New York and I passed through all those states, I probably stopped in three or four states, and I'm not none. I mean, they didn't sell it. They don't sell it. They were like, "Oh, where are you from?" Oh no, 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 no! It is against the law. Like, you know, so all the flavors and because that's what's enticing the kids: the oh. strawberry. And, you know, like, so it is something that we should, we'll probably look at, you know, we do like advocacy on policy changes and at the state legislature, so that may be something that we can look at. Um, We're about to have one working on. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know. But, but, uh, but two years ago, right before COVID hit, my daughter and I were in New York City and it was, they were smoking marijuana on the streets of New York yep. City. It was commonplace. Yeah. yeah. Oh, when I go to Atlanta for trainings, uh, there's a certain hotel we and we stop staying there. You walk out the, um, it's right there downtown, like right downtown by the, um, I forget what it's called. Um, anyways, they you walk out and they're smoking. And we were having youth, you know, we're certified peer specialist youth trainings, and we're like the youth are coming out, and, you know. So I mean, it's yeah, but yeah, and even in New York, I think they just legalized it in New York, um, and so I don't. Yeah. It's an well, issue. I, I think that when, what Courtney was talking about about the legislation, um, um, and they don't want to touch it, you know, because it's about about money. I'm just gonna say it's about money. Folks. 
Yeah, money and votes. So but I will it say takes us to speak out, is what I'm saying. There yeah. was a 10% set aside, I guess, by, I guess, by the Biden administration for um, substance misuse, 10% set aside for substance. So it's supposed to be billions of dollars coming down for substance misuse challenges. So um, in different, like, prevention and peer support and treatment, all the different areas. Um, so 